here with his bird's eye view and a brain to match is Mr. Know-it-all. Hello, Susan. Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, depending on where and when you're watching this broadcast. I'm Thomas Fessler, and this, my friends, is Disclosure Tonight. It's Tuesday, May 31st, 2022. And while we thought it would never happen, the phone call came through today. And yes, we're going to have a great conversation with the two Daves, or the David and the Dave, from the team uh, that made... Uh, a terror in the sky happened. Yes, Mr. Dave Mason, an unbelievable individual. I call him an imaging genius because he's beyond anyone who I've ever seen when it comes to imaging and technologies and putting things together to track down those things we see in the skies. No, it's not the flies that's zooming around my office right now. It's the phenomena. It's better known as UAP. We also have Dave Mason. Yes, he's been around Corey Feldman for too many years to count, and he's also one heck of a UFO investigator. We have the unbelievable David H. Altman. Can't wait to go ahead and bring him out and uh, have a conversation. Along with that, Rob is back in the mad bed, suffering like a son of a bitch. Rob, I hope you're feeling better. But more importantly, we've got the fucking Tom King. Yes, that's right. We've uh, got the F-bomb counter going today because we know where Tom's going to be going with this one. We also have Tim Sinor and uh, along with our guests, Dave Altman again and Dave Mason. It's going to be a great conversation. You guys have seen some of the technology that uh, Dave Alt, I mean Dave Mason has put together that made the, the incredible movie of A Terror in the Sky happen. There is some. We've got a unbelievable amount of talent from the from Hollywood and from here in Washington State. Some people who are beyond it. So let's go ahead and jump out of the studio, uh, into the studio, and let's see if I can find the chat and get this going. Let's see who we have out there right now. Ooh, starting way back in the way back machine. If we we'll just scroll up, Bill H. Welcome, Bill H. Thanks for coming around. Reekin Havoc two fifteen. I think I'm from Earth. You never know. We None of us may be. Case and F, good to have you around. Mr. Michael Elwell and Greg O'Brien. Good to see you, Greggy. Um, good talking with you yesterday. Our Ranch Air Gun Fun Channel, Brian. Welcome along. Mr. Tom King is in the chat, and he's in the back. Welcome. And hello, Brandy Phillips. Hello, beautiful people. Grand Brandy Phillips with your beautiful green hearts and green frogs. Mr. Yellow Tommy Tanker. Evening, morning, all, depending on where you're from. Terry Hall is also in the audience as well. Welcome, Terry, as it sounds like someone's getting attacked by a cat in the back. Metal M Gaming, good to have you around. Uh, he's here to say his name three times, everybody, or just look for it in chat. Bob, Bob, Bob Birkins is here. Yes, we are the only channel known to have given besides his own. Bob Birkins, the, at the uh, wrench. That way no one can silence him. Well, they can, but <laughs> I'm Bill H. Welcome, Bill. Great to have you here. Great to give you that power, Bob. You deserve it. Holy cow. Bob, 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 Bob. <laughs> Welcome, Bob. Dave H. Alt David H. Altman is here as well. Yo, Duders. And Christian Morales. Howdy. Back at you as well. Uh, wow, Bob is at it today in classic form. Oh, look at this. Could it be? Possibly it is. Yes. One of the phenomenas, the phenomena. That's right. If I look for cast sounds, we have to find the phenomena. The phenomena. Yes, yes, yes. Who could that be? That's Gary. No, it's Julie Farrell. <laughs> oh, you spilled your tea all over yourself. Oh boy. How do you know me and Julie aren't the same person? Have you seen us in the same place at the same time? No. See. But her hair is much longer than yours right now, so we know. <laughs> oh, I know my mom gave me a lesbian do. And yes, I'm not Hercules about it. had his hair chopped, and he looked like end up looking like a lesbian. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> went, went from <laughs> um, went from Tarzan to Ellen in one fail swoop. 
Oh, Thank good you. way to put it. Oh, we've got Linda Thompson's around. Welcome, Linda. Thanks for coming to here tonight. If you don't know Linda, you haven't been around here long enough. Uh, Linda is a lifetime experiencer. Yeah, a lifetime. A t- lifetime worth of, of, of it to make her a UFO uh, historian, someone who's been going in, doing a ton of research. Maybe you have not seen a lot of work on Linda's name, but she's done work from from all the major ufologists out there and i can guarantee you've seen some of her stuff and most recently linda she is a mufon investigator because when it comes to linda it's just the facts just the facts which is hard to do with woo but she manages it really well uh, Neo Cal is here welcome Neo Cal. banana buoy is in the audience thanks for coming on out today as I uh, scroll through the endless chats, Robin Hood, 1966, also known as Rob Heatherly, is in the chat, but he's not in the back. Yes. Hey, uh, uh, hey, all. Going to be a killer interview with with the Daves, Thomas, and the Savant, T- Tom fucking King. I have to take uh, the night off into the med bed. Would be a dead weight in this conversation anyway. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate you reaching out and hope Mr. Robbie is doing fine. Oh, wait a minute. We've got a super chat coming in. Wait a minute. How can they be happening already? Is that at? We've got a super chat coming in from W. Decker. Thank you, W. Decker. I hear Tom will be on, so I'm going to try and get this out of the way soon so I don't honor it, interrupt him again. Thank you, Mr. W. Decker. Appreciate your support and the super chat as well. I'll leave that music going as I finish welcoming everybody so I can go ahead and... Uh, Get the show on the road. All right. Thank you, W. Decker. Appreciate that. Let's see who else we have out there. Mr. Michael Elwell. Don't hurt yourself, anybody. Did I say Hoyt? Yeah, I meant Hoyt. Um, Bill H. is around. Robin, Tommy Tanker, Bob Birkins. I I scrolled up, and and apparently, let's get through it. Jenny Girl is here. Welcome, Jenny Girl. Thanks for coming around. I heard possibly you were at that UFO con because they said there was this Jenny Girl that we knew there, so... Uh, we'll, we'll get those stories eventually. There's a super chat coming in. Jan, you're here. Welcome, Jan. Always great to have the lady who's in the middle off from the Brady Bunch. We have X1 is here as well. Uh, looks like he's driving that truck. Thanks for coming on, uh, for uh, coming around, Nikki. I need to give you a call. Absolutely. And I think that is everybody on that note. It's time to bring out our panel and bring out our guests, shall we? Ah, for some people that need no introductions, we got Mr. Tom fucking King, a from uh, a, a phenomenal sky watcher. Well, we got another highly technical sky watcher, Mr. Dave Mason from the movie A Tear in the Sky, as well as Mr. David H. Altman, again from the movie A Tear in the Sky. Welcome, Dave. Appreciate it. And the one, the only, the librarian in waiting. Tim Sinor, welcome, Tim. How you doing, my friend? He's moving. He's frozen. Let me kill the music. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming in, Tim. Thanks for coming around here today. What a crazy day. You know, it's been, there's been so much going on with disclosure in the last couple days. It's, it's been accelerating. Um, I have to say, though, um, Dave, David and Dave, there's been a lot of activity, a lot of momentum that's really has been starting to spin up. I hate to say it since your movie came out. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, pretty much, you know, they say there are no coincidences, but um, I think it was pretty much perfect timing, you know, uh, that. The movie came out and maybe a week or two later, boom, the hearings. And, you know, it's done yeah. nothing but help help the film uh, be more successful. Yeah, the movie's gone and it, it's been uh, the top of the charts. It's It's gotten a lot of views. It's gotten, it's even won awards. But it's something that's truly, uh, no, none of this could have happened with someone like Dave Altman bringing together people and working with the genius of Mr. Dave Mason. Dave, great having you here as well. How are you doing today? It looks like you've got some toys I'm, behind you in I've, the studio. I've got, yeah, I've, I've got some equipment behind me. Um, let's see, i got to look at the camera. 
behind me is the triple spectrum light wave transmitter that was uh, used in the expedition and movie. Um, there's an oscilloscope that was used in the analysis. Uh, so, and, and, and so, yeah, I've got, I've got my equipment home and, and everything that we saw in that movie is, is now safeguarded here. And it's just really exciting to be a part of this, you know, this whole, uh, phenomenon. home and safeguarded. It almost sounds yeah. like you may have had an issue. Well, I think you mentioned you had an issue in the past where some equipment went out and you had to wrangle it freaking mm -hmm. like pulling yeah, UFO the, data out of the Pentagon. And it was to get your own data back. I mean, to get your own the, equipment back. Yeah, it was some legal saber rattling, but I got it back. Yeah. So uh, that was that was a good thing that happened. That'll teach you from, you know, willingly and trusting teammates without getting signed documentation in place. <laughs> yeah, I've been uh, work. I've worked in the game industry for too many years to count. And whenever we put out development kits, where which were probably much cheaper than what your uh, cameras and all your equipment cost, yeah. um, we always had people go ahead and sign uh, their, their not their lives away, but basically go ahead right. and sign liabilities, sign responsibility, and everything for any equipment. And then any time under any duress, you could go ahead. And request such equipment to be returned and if not well th they're fully right. liable up on their own accord yeah i think i'd like to show um one of my oscilloscopes here so this oh yeah is a, I'll, I'll show up close so you can see the model nice. number it's an um it's an mdo 4104 c with a, a six a built-in six gigahertz uh, spectrum analyzer. is that a tecto tectronics yeah it's tectronics it's i've never product. seen one i've never seen one that wasn't with the crt it's the first yeah, time. Is, but, yeah. yeah, yeah, but this this is current product. Um, it's thirty three thousand dollars with the options. So Whoa. you can look it up. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not. I don't play with toys. I use real <laughs> test and measurement equipment. You know, I, I use the state of the art equipment. Yeah, but they need and to have then, a display in those things that's uh, that's yeah. refreshing at two hundred forty frames but, uh, a second. Yeah, Ooh, and look and at then that. You see the, the size of the lens on this clear camera. Would you look uh, at that? This, this particular camera with uh, with lens set was over fifty thousand. So, yeah, I'm not playing with toys. <laughs> <laughs> now, Tim, Tim, you've heard some of the prices for the equipment. What's going on there? I know you wanted to go out and buy some toys, but my goodness. Yeah, yeah, it's it's unfortunate that yeah, so, some no, of the stuff that's available, like it's really in so. therm thermal cameras, you know, or FLIR. Uh, you know, there's a huge price range. You can buy uh, a cheap app you can put on your phone, you know, you adapt to it and you can make it into a thermal camera, but that's, you know, for a few hundred dollars. And then when you want to use real equipment that can do fast frame video rates and get cold temperatures and get you temperature read back in, in laboratory type uh, standards, you, you got to spend some money. It's unfortunate, but that's yeah. what you have to do. I, I guess when you're trying to, to capture yeah. UAP, that are invisible in the sky and you can't see them and you've got you you have to have equipment the state of the art tom king i saw your hand up there i need to jump to you oh i just i just love that state of the art ghetto blaster he has you know <laughs> um I was that's wondering what it looked like <laughs> come on hold it up yeah. like a ghetto blaster come on yeah yeah it's got a <laughs> It's a yeah, great I'm one. walking down the street with that thing, looking for UFOs. Or <laughs> yeah. Um, how does that help in the, the UAP hunt? So when um, I get recordings, uh, so this is, has to do with not so much on the FLIR video, but on my inventions, because I've invented a thermal imaging camera that will convert modulated cold temperatures and heat into sound. I just posted that yesterday or, or a few days ago on YouTube. And, and so I've got, I invented a thermal camera that I re-engineered so that it will, instead of doing videos and photos, it'll take the thermal information or, th or long wave infrared and convert it into sound. And then I can look at it and analyze it on this oscilloscope and also do spectrum analysis. And so and that's, that's why I like using, you know, the better equipment. And then I've got the night vision goggles that I've re-engineered that, uh, well, they work as night vision, conventional, but they can also convert night vision into sound um and then so we can listen to low light levels that also has just an audio uh, source that you know, we need to analyze afterward after recording if you catch something anomalous you want to get those signatures off of the audio recording yeah 
<laughs> and then the, yeah, and then the, uh, the photo dial binoculars is the other one, which is like, um, here, I got them here. So these uh, were so, shown in so. the movie. They have a volume control, or this is the, um, the step gain control. This is the volume control and another gain control. And then there's a defocused laser mounted in it. So what that does is, is the laser is defocused. So when something is uh, received in these binoculars, we can transmit back through the defocused laser the information that's received. So if we, if we detect an object in the sky and we don't know what it is, and it's maybe transmitting something we can hear, it makes a funny sound, we can at least beam it back to them and, and hope to establish some sort of communication. So we're just relaying back what's received in these binoculars. And But the, you, you can also take the audio patch of this and run it to a recorder so it can be analyzed on this oscilloscope or other you know analysis equipment. You know, you're making the, the U.S. military look bad, Dave, because you're actually doing more than what the military is doing. Because they, uh, if you remember at the hearings, uh, the, at least out in the and out in the open, the senators were asked. <laughs> the senator, or actually the the House representatives asked. You know, they're coming in. These UAP are coming into our airspace. They're coming into our training grounds. Are we doing anything to go ahead and contact them and? and tell them something and their answer was mm -hmm. no was that yeah, a lie or are they just that naive yeah the, the hearings were a disappointment i mean the whole the, it was like it was an exercise of confession and avoidance it, it is where they were putting information out there but then avoiding it and, and then bringing out information that had already been debunked and then then not even looking at the um the real information you know it's like they're they acknowledged a few things, but they didn't acknowledge other yeah. things. And it was just a lot of obfuscation, um, you know, framus, you know, just gibberish. I, I wasn't, I wasn't impressed from the content standpoint. I was impressed by the fact that there was a congressional hearing on it. Yeah. I just have to bring this up really quick. Greg O'Brien is saying, David H. Altman, what's up, Altman? But I have to bring this up, and I have to do a blow up of the picture. I don't know if people have been around the audience and around the show enough. My gosh. No, it's not mean. It's the Gray Owl. He used to be a visitor, a, a regular on our show sometimes. He used to be around here all the time. If that hair was white, it would be Mr. Gray Owl. Oh, it looks, it looks like Ming from uh, It is Mike Ming, Gordon. but yeah. it also it's looks like Gray Owl. Max von Sindow. Absolutely. Oh, I know. Uh, great stuff and everything. Let me uh, jump across to uh, Altman. I've, we've had you down in the corner long enough, my friend. Uh, you know, you're one of the people that actually got me talking with uh, Mr. Mason and being uh, becoming aware of uh, some of the things that were coming in the future and just everything that you've been involved in. Uh, you've been in, if you want to call it, the UFO scene for from a production standpoint for such a long time. Tell us about it. Well, not even from a production standpoint. I mean, I've been into this for, I mean, at least up to the second grade. Um, I can see that. I'm You're okay. We got you really, a little bit, but hopefully you'll be able to. Yeah, we got you. You got me now. <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, my when my parents were divorced, when they got divorced, I was about seven or eight years old, and um, my mom and I went to go live with my grandmother, and she was a librarian. So after school, I would go to the library and hang out with my grandmother until my mom got off work and could pick me up. And you know, I just sat in the the monster section and then moved over to the paranormal, which you know got me into the whole UFO, Loch Ness monster, Bigfoot. You know, everything that you've ever seen on In Search Of, I learned first. In Interesting. Books, and that's how I got into yeah, it. Yeah, it's great that all of us, have you had, uh, besides getting there in books, what draw you to it? Was it Hollywood or was it something that you ran into on your own? Um, the Hollywood thing with UFOs kind of happened by accident. Um, I was already uh, living and working in Hollywood for a long time. And I ended up with a client um, named David O'Leary, and he was the writer and producer of um, oh wow the show uh, Project Blue Book. And him and I went to a conference in Megacon in Vegas, and that's where I first met Kevin Day. And yeah, the rest is you know. <laughs> Yeah, the, the first my first conference I met I met uh, Kevin Day, George Knapp, Jeremy Corbell, 
and uh, a lot of other cool people and got to hang out with them for the whole weekend and stayed in touch. And then eventually um, it just all came together and I was able to use my personal yeah, UFO research. Absolutely. Uh, in, you in mentioned TV. Kevin Day, uh, a great honor to the man, who no longer part of UAPX, which neither of you guys are as well, but he is, although other people have claimed differently, Mr. Voice, uh, he is the founder of UAPX and that one uh, role goes to that individual and without him, you know, maybe this stuff wouldn't have come together. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's for sure. I mean, the whole, the whole thing. Oh, um, I was Dave, just going to say that uh, Kevin Day was, was the guy who put me on his team. Uh, and so I was involved with him going back to, I think it was September, 2019 is when he, when he put me on his team. I could see why he'd pull you into it. I mean, uh, back in that time, compared to where you are now, what kind of mm -hmm. equipment did you have in your arsenal? And uh, where did I you have to take it to go work with what you did? Um, the things I, I had to get were additional recorders. Um, so, Because I wasn't always just running eight, eight clear cameras, but I'll, I'll show you one of the recorders. I, I happen to have these things in reach. Like I say, I, I own a lot of cool equipment. Um, so I had to buy two of these AJA recorders uh, oh, for Magic, recording. Yeah. Mm. Uh, now these are these are oh, AJA. AJA. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, these are these are over four thousand a piece, yeah. and I bought two of them. And and that's I had so I spent eight grand just in video recorders so I can record. Buy refurbished, you'll save a lot of money on those. <laughs> they're, they're they're new product. There's no refurbished ones available, unfortunately. They're uh, only because they had just come out you know, uh, that I'm just year. Giving you that's a hard why time. I bought them. I would certainly consider it if it's oh, yeah. available. Mm. Uh, I had to buy that. Um, I don't think I had to really buy anything else, but it was within a couple of months of being uh, put on Kevin's team that I developed the other technologies and had the working prototypes on it. And those were the the night vision goggles that convert light to sound with the defocused laser. I just got actually a dual. Um, I should. I, I don't have it in front of me, but. Um, they have a defocused laser that does ultraviolet laser and then red, and then there's a blend adjustment on it, and then that laser is modulated. Right. And it converts light to sound. Yeah. I just put a YouTube video up, uh, I think a couple of days ago, and you can watch that demo video. And one of the recordings that's pretty cool was a meteorite went in front of it, and you can hear the whoosh sound that the meteorite makes uh, from the light that's gathered from it. So it's, it's really a cool thing that it does. So that was a new uh, developed technology and then the FLIR thermal camera that I re-engineered. And, and that was the hardest one for me to do was to take a perfectly good working FLIR thermal camera that costs a ton of money and go in and change the entire circuitry. You know, 80% of it, I just put my own circuits in it because I, I really wanted to do something different that hadn't been done before. So now, now it's, it just serves as a sound device and an example of that FLIR camera is I, I was panning it in the sky and a bird flock went by and I could hear the temperature changes of the wings that were flapping and it just kind of had a rumble sound that it made in the FLIR camera. Uh, oh, wow. For what I recorded. So it's just a new device that is part of the arsenal. And I've got other technologies I'm developing I can't talk about yet because I, I've already had somebody trying to uh, take credit for one of my inventions. And so... Uh, I, I don't need to help somebody do that again. Yeah. Now, granted, other people out there, which we laughed at when we heard it, said that, oh, the kind of technology you put together is easily someone that any can, anyone can go ahead and sit down on a bench and rebuild this stuff. I mean, Dave, sure. you, you've got such a pedigree <laughs> with re regards to your experience and everything and everything that you've done. Tell us about some of this, you know, your, some of your background and the kind of stuff that you do. Uh, well, what I, you know, I worked as an electronic engineer at uh, Nye Viking, which is a ham radio product manufacturer. They hired me as an electronic engineer when I was 22, and that was designing RF power monitors, antenna tuner circuits, uh, and uh, that company moved to Idaho, and I, I didn't want to move to Idaho. Then I had my own engineering consulting uh, company where I, I contracted with other companies just offering my services. I did that. And then in the mid 90s, I partnered up with another guy and uh, he had similar talents, but he was more he, he was more geared on the on the business side of things. Uh, and we uh, we formed a corporation 
I don't, I can't say the name of the uh, company because of privacy concerns and uh, NDAs, because I, I contract with the government, I contract with other entities, and I don't, uh, I don't need to mention things. But um, we did a lot of uh, custom engineering on electronic test and measurement equipment. So, you know, one of the things I did, I can at least talk about this, was um, I would hot rod oscilloscopes. And I would take oscilloscopes, electronics like the 2213 oscilloscope, which was yeah. rated 60 megahertz bandwidth. Yeah, we used to go ahead and, and use those when we were making a lot of handheld games, especially those little five-in-one video game controllers. When we were debugging mm -hmm. the boards that came out of Taiwan that weren't working the way mm -hmm. they should, actually designed in Taiwan, made in the factories yep. in, in Hong Kong, uh, actually, that we had to go ahead and with the prototypes and try and figure what was wrong. But I remember those babies. Yeah, I hot-rodded those to do over 100 megahertz. Oh, nice. And yeah, they were rated at 60. And so I, I contracted on several units in doing that. And then I had to certify that they could do 100 megahertz bandwidth with the uh, 3 dB roll off and perturbations were below 3% or whatever that what was specified on there. So it did custom engineering for certain products because there were certain entities that needed to have hot rotted products. And uh, <laughs> over, you overclock the freaking uh, no, analyzer. No, it wasn't CPU. This was this is purely an analog. Scale. Well, I know. Yeah, uh, and yeah, from an analog yeah. sense, you took something that went yeah. to 10 and you gave it to go to 15. Yeah, you went to 11, if you want to remember Spinal Tap. I know, uh, but that's why so, I said you went to 15, be well beyond 11. But, so, yeah, I, I did a lot of that. And uh, also, um, I, I, yeah, I've also posted a YouTube video of a, a handheld um, vector impedance oscilloscope analyzer that fits in the palm of the hand. And that was designed uh, strictly from scratch. And I was going to go into production with it, but I realized... You know, the problem is what you have when you introduce a, a new electronic device is there's big corporations that are doing similar things that they like to try to squish the little guy and and not let them bring a product forward so they can say, oh, you're you're violating our patent or you're violating something and they'll just outspend you. And so you have to lawyer up and say, well, no, I'm not. And it could be a ludicrous type uh, legal thing where they know they don't have any grounds but they'll make you spend your money. I've seen it happen to my friends who have done startups where they were actually bankrupted because they didn't want that company getting off the ground. So I, I, I just said, well, I'll just keep this prototype for myself and use it in my own test lab. And, and that, that device is also shown on YouTube so people can go there and, and see that invention. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've had your hands in a lot of different technologies, uh, finding mm -hmm. stuff when it's not out there going ahead and building it for others, which gives you the, uh, well, funded building it for others, which gives you the mm -hmm. insight and the ability to take that knowledge and roll it into f future inventions and future endeavors. Tim? I have a quick question about one of your inventions, in fact, Dave. Um, in the film, you used a piece of design to send music out. Yes. And... Um, I guess my question would be, did you see the response and what did that look like? And if you're able to use your binoculars also on any of the UAP successfully, what did it sound like? Okay, in the, in the movie itself, uh, we didn't actually capture anything in the binoculars per se, you know, at the moment. Um, what we did have going on on the transmitter that's sitting behind me, because uh, once a infrared, um, and then the other is a full, full spectrum, and then one's ultraviolet. There's slight um, overlap, but they're spread spectrum, and they're modulating frequency modulation and amplitude modulation. So we're, we're really just trying to go high tech and make this spread spectrum. And so we were transmitting my music, my, my solo guitar music, Carolyn's uh, compositions. I was looping a... Um, receiver that was detecting light in space and then just transmitting it back. So in case something did show up and start sending data out, we can just beam it right back at them. And that was running 24 seven. So I don't know for sure if there was an encounter that could have happened. I mean, this could have happened when I had my back turned or when I was not on the rooftop or others weren't paying attention, but we kept it looping. And 
And then also every now and then I would switch in. I have some recordings of whales and dolphins that was supplied to me by an expert who wishes to remain anonymous. But I requested that I get recordings of, of whales and dolphins that are not in captivity, but that are in the wild and, and that they're happy. And then I was also beaming that. I'm surprised and, he didn't take the whale sound that came uh, broadcasting from the sky. Where was that near Israel or something? A couple of years ago, I remember seeing a hmm. video of that. No, I haven't. I haven't heard anything of it. But the, the reason for this, I'll just mention about the whales and dolphins. It was suggested by Kevin Day and um, Michael W. Hall, and it was. I, I had said to the group, I said, I, you know, I want to transmit something. And I don't believe that sending computer data or prime number, it just didn't seem like they were going to be impressed by our, our knowledge of numbers. So I thought by doing something different, well, they made that suggestion. And then when I thought about it, I thought it was a great idea because you're, you're sending out a message from a species that's been on the planet for millions of years, yeah. brains bigger than ours. And we're, we're sending the message that we accept a species that doesn't look like us. Yeah. And we hold them in higher regard. So then that would make us more approachable. So well, they... I, I've heard stories of from Ted Rowe of mm -hmm. uh, dolphins, you know, 60, 80 feet under the water, interacting with saucers that have been seen down there. And divers want well, to try to get... Originally, Thomas, ori originally what was thought was Kevin thought that there could be a correlation between whale migration and, and sightings of UAP. Oh. Well, yeah. so that's that's what really that's what really well started. migrating doll, uh, uh, whales do follow magnetic sources, which could kind of tie into the whole uh, UAP bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a possibility. I always I think of Star it. Trek I mean, Four yes. when I think of whales and UFOs. Yeah. As Greg O'Brien <laughs> brings up a story I share, shared with him today, I don't know if you heard. But it's true, they found out the facts, and it's been verified that dolphins get high off of pufferfish. While the smallest amount of the pufferfish, any kind of tissue from it, will kill a human. Apparently, it makes them all giggity, giggity, goo. Um, I actually have a, another follow-up question for Dave Altman, if you don't mind. Um, Dave, when you spotted something with Michael Hall originally, I think you guys were the first to spot something in the film. Um, were you able to spot that with your naked eye or did you notice it through the, the gear? Yeah. So, um, what's, what's not shown in the film is the first, I think night, first two nights. Um, I mean, it's shown in the film, but you don't see anything that I'm recording because we didn't, re there was a mix up with production and I didn't have the right gear to record the night vision. So the first night I actually saw something with my naked eye before it was dark. I don't know what it was. It was white. It was there for a second. It wasn't illuminated. It was like a white object and then it was gone. Um, then the moment we finally could figure out that we could record, it was right after I started that I was playing with the night vision and I looked up and I didn't see anything. And then I put the night vision up to record, and boom, there was something there. But that one, no, it was only with the night vision. And that's why I got so excited. If I had seen it both ways, I would have been like, ah, whatever. You know, it could right. be this, it could be that. You know, but, you know, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what yeah, it was. I have to, you recorded it. You know, you recorded it but with your cell phone through the Binox. Yeah, so um, Dave had let us use um, generation two and three night vision, and what I would do is I would take I would take the night vision goggles, hold the iPhone up to you know where you look, and just hit record. Yeah, absolutely, I have to all that stuff. I mean, it could have it could have been it could have been. Better. I have to yeah, say, David, you it was an job. unbelievable opportunity. We've had Michael Hall on the show a couple times. What it was it like to be able to spend so much time with Michael over a week? Such an amazing person. Oh, I can't wait to do that again. <laughs> it was cool. We had a good time. We had absolutely. Fun. He, he's a great guy. We've had him on here. Challenging connection. His. You know, but you do guys too have something alike. You both have crappy systems for streaming. <laughs> Just giving you a hard time. What the hell? Oh, uh oh, my hey, David. Not anything uh, not in the movie that you want to talk about or tell us about? But 
Either, either uh, of you. What, oh, okay. So, <laughs> like, you were telling me that... how you got to the island and, like, how, you know, you, you had to hump haul, haul all the gear. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. So, I'll tell that story because it's my favorite part of bitching about the movie. Um, so, when we first got to the island, it was just uh, myself, Michael Hall, and uh, Grant Smith, who was our camera guy. And Michael Hall, um, you know, he w wasn't in the best of health at the time. So um, I guess the worst part is that there's no, there's really no cars on Catalina Island. There might be a couple that are there by, you know, government or police or, or something. Otherwise, you're on foot or you're in a, in a cab if you can get one or a golf cart. So Michael couldn't carry anything heavy. So Grant Smith and myself had to carry all the production gear, all the UFO, like all the night vision, all the, you know, all the, like everything Dave Mason gave us, everything from production. And we had two locations um, on the island, two different hotels. And we were on the roof of both. And I think they were both about maybe, I think one was about five stories. The other was about you use the elevator. So of course. I had to carry all elevator? the gear up. <laughs> nope, couldn't use the elevator. They wouldn't, nope, couldn't use the elevator. All the way up, all the way down. So that's why I always say the best part of the movie was when Chrissy <laughs> Newton showed up because she was there to help count nice. some Chrissy Newton, right? But, you she know, I understand what it's like when you have health <laughs> issues and different things that hold you back. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee, although Michael Hall couldn't carry this stuff, if he had the opportunity to, he would have been doing it. The, the only only reason that it pissed me off was that because by the by the time we logged everything up there and got everything set up, I didn't want to look for UFOs, man. I wanted to go to bed, you know. But I was surprised because that first when I first saw something that I freaked out about, I was wide awake and I could have yeah. been there all night long. You know. But the question I was, was did they I see you? Did you get any hitchhiker effect coming out of it? Um, I don't think so, but um, I do know that I had two possible sightings of objects oh, when I got Well, home. if I remember I correctly, in conversations before, you've had several sightings from, from your mom's place in Florida, right? Well, I saw one object multiple times. Could have been a sat. I'm thinking it could have been a satellite at this point. I don't know, but then we saw uh, what looked like two big cigar-shaped uh, ships that were. I live out by Cape Canaveral right now. I'm in Florida, so I'm always really sketchy about you know claiming something that it's not in the air. But we saw these two cigar looked like cigar-shaped objects. I called my mom out and she I said, "Hey, keep an eye on these. I'm going in to get my phone to record." When I came back, she's like, oh, they're gone. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, I turned yeah. for a second. It's one of gone. those things we learn eventually to carry these things with us wherever you are and then be able to pull it out at any time and be able to capture it. Because it's that time you have to run back inside to get it, your camera, before it's halfway across the sky or almost out of view. I, yeah, I find the, the cameras the are thing, worse other... than uh, old videos. My old video camera took me... I think I had this down to 17 seconds by the time I grabbed it, powered it up, spool spun up inside the VHS, and it engaged on the head. Now with the phone, it's this. It's hit your thumb to unlock it, put a damn password in, fiddle around with the camera. It takes longer, I found, than 17 seconds with the phone. More convenient, but it's longer. Yeah. I have a, I have a quick question. Um, Dave Mason, um, if you were approached to perhaps present some of the data that you're finding on your own and that you did with Carolyn, mm -hmm. um, would you consider showing your data and presenting to Congress if you were asked in a formal presentation? Uh, yes, I would. And the data I have is, is, in essence, it's the FLIR recordings. I would have to offer the, uh, the technical information within those recordings so that they would have a better understanding of it because there's a deep uh, mis, um, misconceptions about FLIR uh, thermal, thermal camera videos. I've, I've seen some of the experts discussing them and 
and, and even the debunkers who really demonstrate that they don't understand the technology as they debunk things, as well as the people who are supporting them. So I, I would have to, um, if my videos were being examined and under those conditions, then I would have to uh, yeah. decide that. Um, you know, I have to ask one question. You got someone like Mick West, right? And his official mm -hmm. training and his claim to fame is, is creating Tony Hawk Pro Skater back on the Dreamcast okay. and, and PlayStation 2. And when that came out, revolutionary game, but what it was, was seriously, it was something that fake, it was a fake simulation that faked mm -hmm. physics, faked gameplay, faked controls. Everything was scripted to make you feel and think that you're doing something, right? Mm -hmm. That's not real. So now we've got someone who's he made his claim to fame, his retirement and everything from making games that fooled people. And he's trying to take that knowledge of fake physics and such and some good programming that goes along with it on some CPUs that were out there at the time. But to use that to go ahead and trying to call out and say everything with UAP is fake. Now, you come from an area of an imaging background, signal processing, building custom equipment. You're mm -hmm. not here to go ahead and, and look at stuff and disprove it you're here to look at it from a factual representation saying if we're looking at the image and the offset of the image from or the lighting from the iris is 180 degrees which makes it makes you understand that this isn't being faked and the image we're getting in you look at it from a technological from a videographic standpoint and trying to understand what what's going on not to rip it apart but to truly take the different parts and call them for what they are. Yeah, that's, that's the proper approach, whether if you've got a, a debunker mindset or if you're advocating videos. And I don't always fault debunkers because here's the problem. There's, there is a lot of fake videos that are out there. There's, there's videos of satellites and birds that are on the YouTube that are, are running rampant or even all, all the fake material. And, you know, that, that kind of stuff needs to be debunked. Um, but what I do fault on the debunker standpoint is when they say they know more than our pilots, that they're better trained observers than our pilots or our military personnel uh, or our astronomers, for that matter, or our physicists. You know, and, and so if you're debunking from an armchair standpoint and not from a professional standpoint, then I, I'm going to call you an armchair debunker. Yeah, and then you have to use the proper physics on any video or photo, and I, I I sometimes see them apply correctly to the photos and videos that have been hoaxed or that are explainable. Um, but what I find is there's that mindset. No matter what's presented to them, they're always going to play that role of debunker because if they say, "Hey, this is a video I can't explain. I've applied all of my debunking." and it, I can't debunk this, well, now they've lost that entitlement. They've lost that identity as being the resident debunker. That way you won't be called upon again and your, your credibility shot. Yeah. So in essence, a lot of debunkers, much like the people who are promoting themselves in this field, a lot of the debunkers are promoting themselves as debunkers. So this just means every time a UFO photo or video comes out and their name's called out for it, it's that opportunity to make a YouTube video, uh, garner attention, make make some profit off of it, uh, self promote as the resident debunker, and and just play that role every time. I mean, for example, if that was my role and I and that became my identity and my livelihood depended on it, and then somebody presented data to me that I couldn't debunk, I I'm, I'm going to make every excuse. I'm going to say it's swamp gas, or I'm going to say it's CGI. I'm going to use whatever excuse I can to debunk it so that I look acceptable among the people who are following my, my analysis. And so that, that's the problem we've got, uh, you know, it, from the debunker side, but also on the promoter side, because I've seen promoters taking fake videos and running with it, trying to self promote with it. And that, that's another, that's, a, that's another no, no. And then you're, you're giving the debunkers ammo. And, and rightfully so, because there's a lot of stuff that that needs to get debunked that is is obviously you know hoaxed or or is a has a prosaic explanation. Yeah, it's it's one of those situations, Dave, when you run into it, where the personality becomes bigger 
than what they're actually trying to be involved in. That's exactly what yeah. you described. Yeah, that's exactly what it is, is, is you got, in essence, you know, that's the contamination of the data is you've got people who are self-promoting as debunkers, and then you got people who are promoting all kinds of narratives, you know, that uh, and, and it's just funny what I follow is somebody will come up with a story and, and then it gets copied and pasted on another website. And then somebody embellishes that story. It gets copied and pasted again. And then you, so when you research the story, you find it's in all these different websites. There may be some variations, but it adds credence to the story. And then it, it becomes indoctrined as factual. Right. Uh, I mean, it's, so if you were to make up, uh, you know, this, this spaceship landed and these purple headed people eaters came out with seven tails and 11 eyes. And, I hear they were in a cave, though. Yeah. But if you if you wrote the story up and if you said it with a serious, you know, uh, a suggestion to it and somebody who believed in you ran with it and it gets copied and pasted, pretty soon it becomes one of the elements to uh the this phenomenon that we have aliens that are these purple headed you know people eaters or whatever you call it and and that's what's going on it, it's really unfortunate because there's real data mixed in there you just have to properly vet it and not and not follow the anecdotal information that's out there because yeah. there's a, tr a tremendous amount of even the high tech where people say oh we have this or we have that and you know they say oh our satellites can read newspaper from outer space well, when somebody makes that statement, I know they have never studied optical physics. Oh you my God! It reminds me of the old filters they had on, uh, uh, what do you call it, on uh, Special Victims Unit, where they would go ahead and have a low quality, you know, uh, standard definition signal that they would have on a monitor, and they say, "Okay, let's go ahead and do uh, a resolution oh, blow yeah. up," and they take that little part of it, blow it up, and they bring the detail like it's crystal clear a hundred hundred times magnification and clarity over resolution and i'm sure tom king has seen this kind of stuff in the hollywood stuff you know it's 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 you know not true i've seen it enough Dave, times how are you Go ahead for tom in at area 51 i mean you seem like the type of guy that they would maybe he is and he just can't yeah, tell these, you these government contracts i'm thinking this is the real bob lazar right in front of us we don't even know it because if like you're not working there as smart as you are, then who the hell is? Like the 5,000 people that work there and uh, cycle out after 20 years in the government, and they don't talk. So, and, you know, I, I've met a lot of sky watchers in, in the field, almost all of them. And when I run into them, they have their collection of cameras. Um, they usually have an old camera and then a newer one and maybe some get into night vision a few into thermal but they don't have eight they don't have eight of the same ones because they're better half well yeah why are you buying so many of the same thing so how did you get eight flare video cameras and then an array of just different night vision like you're like you have an army load of stuff how, how did that come about uh, well, I, I do pretty well for what I do in my business. And so, I mean, just, uh, one, one example, just on one, uh, one contract deal, I got, uh, enough money to buy a brand new Lexus IS 350 F sport. You know? So I, I bought that car. I, I posted on Facebook. That was just from one, uh, one contract. So, um, Area that is one. No, <laughs> it's seen if it'll slip. You know, you never know. No, uh, but people I'll, just, read I'll your say face and I, uh, pe people that work at Area Fifty One are smarter than me, guaranteed. Much no smarter way. than me. Yeah. I have a quick question, Dave. Um, at this point, um, with all of your evidence and the data that you're gathering and all the gear that you currently have, um, what is your current and I'm assuming new mission statement or mission? Um. Well, I'm going to be developing uh, new te technology. I've already got one new device already developed and tested. Uh, I'm excited about it. I'm not going to discuss it yet because I, I okay. mentioned uh, Thomas because uh, one guy was actually trying to run with uh, one of my inventions, trying to proclaim it as his. But actually, uh, I I posted a video predating uh, you know his claim by two years. So, <laughs> and, so if anything, and, he it, saw your video. Yeah, well, he did. Uh, he did actually. He, he and so he just thinks I was I was uh, sequestering it. So, 
uh, that's the kind of thing that I have to be concerned about. And this is why until I, I waited till after the movie came out that then I, I went ahead and made my invention videos public because they were already shown in the movie. And, and that was the, the timing of it because it, it is surprising. I've got another friend in this field who uh, is also, he's, he's worked on some other inventions, not so much in this uh, UF, ufology, but he, he's told me stories of how many times he's had his ideas taken and run with people that he partnered with and things. And I, I, I don't want that happening again to me. So I'm, I'm going to uh, be real cautious going forward. Yeah. Either that or just if you're dealing with different people over time, my friend, put together some good ki uh, 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 ironclad NDAs and non-competition agreements. And that way, if you're going to be sharing things with yeah, people, you can go. Unfortunately, unfortunately, only some people, you know, abide. Oh, by I know, but yeah. even sometimes, well, there. Yes, if woman's rope, Thomas has that. Down. And if anybody yeah. hasn't seen the videos from Mr. Jerry McGowan that were posted of the interior control room, which is a, a place that wasn't supposed to go out from Skinwalker Ranch, I wonder how that got in the Discord rooms. It happens sometimes, and there are people out there who unfortunately don't go ahead and respect the agreements they sign. But either way, if you get the agreement, you get it signed and countersigned, you can go to a judge easy and say fricking and give them the ability to go ahead and uh you can't get yes, but you can go ahead and shut someone up and uh take away all sources of revenue and their ability to survive. And it's easy to do it. Trust me, I had a really good lawyer, his name was Barry Friedman, if that means anything. And he taught me the art of negotiating contracts and dealing with a lot of, uh, if you want to call it intellectual property stuff. And video game licenses and content is no different than what we're dealing with in UAP and what we're dealing with Dave's inventions. It's just about a matter of getting the paperwork in place, A, as a deterrent, and B, making sure if they step across that line, you freaking smash them because otherwise you're just going to be a patsy. Let's, we have a super chat coming in. From Krista Morales saying, "Do this, doing this, in my web browser. Thank you guys for doing what you do every day. We've got something to talk about, especially today with Mr. Dave Mason and Dave Altman. Great conversation, guys, so far. Yeah. Um, Tim, go ahead, Tom. Or Did Tom? You have a question, Tim? Tom? Tom. I have another question. I got a million. Go for uh, it, Dave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> does anybody have any inventions like you? Your you can point this at a, a light and turn it into sound. Are you the only one um, with stuff like this? Uh, let me let me clarify that. Um, so my first, um, I, I'm hearing loud music in the background. Sorry, there... sorry guys. Let me go ahead and turn okay. that down for you. Hold on. Go ahead. Let me let me. Um, it's gone. Take let me care. explain that. So that idea, you know, it, it came into mind, and then back in 1981, you know, I made the photo dial binoculars. But I also, when I built those things, I read a Radio Shack publication, and it was in a Radio Shack where they called a do-it-yourself engineer's notebook. And in that notebook, there was a circuit that had, a, I remember it had a TLO 84 op amp and a phototransistor, a few resistors, and it was called a light wave communicator. And it was just this little kit you could build using Radio Shack parts and, um, it, it, it had a, a, an LED and it was called a light wave communicator. And so it was, uh, you could actually transmit information over this. So this was actually in a Radio Shack publication that I found back at that time. So I'm sure others had built that circuit and probably put them in binoculars or put them in telescopes or whatever. Uh, you know, it's, it's still, in essence, technology that was developed during the fiber optic communication uh, craze because you're still using phototransistors or photodiodes um, amongst uh, splices of fiber optic cabling. And the only difference is you're just taking that technology and putting it inside binoculars. And But what I did different was I, I engineered my own low noise JFET circuit. So I had, did a bunch of experiments in trying to get the maximum yield and sensitivity out of a photodiode and keeping the noise figures down. And I, I remember I used LSK170 JFETs. I used um, what they call foil resistors, shielded foil. These are resistors retail are like $30 each. You know, normally a, a resistor is like two cents. 
they're the lowest noise capable component. So I, I did that in order to get the maximum gain so I could get the maximum sensitivity. Um, but I'm sure there's somebody who's experimented with it at one time or another or, or has built something and maybe they just haven't uh, talked about it. But I know I, I built it in 1981 uh, and I had friends that looked at this thing that, you know, that would testify on it. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly saw in a Radio Shack publication, not involving binoculars, but the concept of the circuitry. So it's, it's been around for, for quite a long time. I've never um, heard about it till now, so it's fascinating. Yeah, it is fascinating. It's a great invention. Um, Dave Altman, um, as an investigator, um, what kind of advice do you think you could give to people that are hoping to have an interaction with UFO or UAP? <laughs> I, I hear you. It's one. I'm sorry. I'm just fixing yeah. Tim's camera. He's a little small a little, off center <laughs> well you're too a little uh there we go we got you no let, no we, we'll get you again all right sorry guys it's I've, I've been doing this one guest at okay. a time if you've noticed everyone has been getting bigger and centered well david altman moved his camera thank god i'm to fix you but i fix now tim senor tom king and dave mason. mason yes yeah um so other than um, Dave Mason um, and his gear, is yeah. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. obviously that was that was a joke. Um, <laughs> not, really. not really, but but. <laughs> so I get asked this every day. What was that? How do you see one? Of, I get asked this every day. How do you What's see that? one of these He's... things? Oh, so I mean, th 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 there's only one actual good answer to that question it's like keep looking up you know like if you're if that's the, it's like you know that's the first step you know if, if you, especially if you can't afford um any type of equipment you know if if maybe uh what what was that <laughs> No, it's Thomas. No, it's Thomas's work. Oh, sorry story. about that. Yeah, I've got I, I guess things going. To, to further Thanks for reminding me, Gary. Story, I didn't realize. Um, do you think that um, trying to use consciousness or anything like that is important as an investigator? Or I mean, I I personally have never. I, I've personally never um, right. tried to do a CE5, yeah. and we get that question a lot. A lot of people, uh, when we do interviews for the film, ask us, did we try that? Um, we, we didn't. We wanted to keep this as scientific as possible. But on the other end of that, the first night I was out there on Catalina Island, I was praying to something or asking something to please let me yeah. see it, you know? So... The intention was there, whether yeah. it was conscious or subconsciously, whether or not at the end of the day. That but it's not like you were dropping I, I, into I I crown never, chakra meditation, layered with samadhi meditation, going ahead and sending out a, uh, a specific come here now message using emotion, memory and thought to kind of bring each word across and repeating it three times. <laughs> No. And, and sometimes, yeah, you know, sometimes that. we could say, let's get out there and let's do CE5 and bring it out. But there's different people at different skill levels of consciousness. And sometimes it's great to go ahead and find some of them. Not that they're going to go, oh, wow, here we come. Let's bring it into the purple aliens come out of the cave. No, it's, it's something we're going to get into the situation where if there is this ability, this consciousness layer that goes there to even... Avi Loeb and, of course, uh, Jacques Vallée totally uh, adhere to, to get some, forget about the the over-the-top people who are into the meditation and into the, the alien scene and everything. Just get some people who are really skilled at meditation, and the, this is the kind of stuff they do. Bring them in and focus their skills and stuff to see what they can do. Right. And and also, I'm sure that I yeah. wasn't the only one. I mean, obviously, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Oh, yeah. You know, talking to their higher power or whatever is out there saying, please let me see something. You know, it just. Yeah, it just, is just being human. You know, did it yeah. work? 
I don't know. We yeah. saw something. I don't, well, I don't know. I, yeah. I saw something. For yeah. everyone who's seen the video, which I believe includes everybody on this yeah. particular panel and on the show tonight as guests, we've seen the movie. And you did catch stuff, and you caught it a couple nights in a row, better than what we were getting out of the the dilapidated white SUV that was out off to the sides of things. But you guys captured some really good stuff. I have um, uh, um, another final uh, follow-up question for Dave Mason, if that's okay. Um, Dave, um, what drives your passion in the UAP field? Oh, that's a good question. Uh it, it started um, when I was 13, and uh, I was reading UFO books and, and checking them out at the library. There was no internet at the time, so this goes back to, uh, oh, I think it's ni uh, it like 1978 or whenever I was 13. I, I don't know if I want to say how old I am. Um, anyway, uh, I, I was reading these books, and there was a lot of descriptions about UFOs interfering with compasses and interfering or, or causing radio interference, but also uh, they were fluctuating lights or had lights that were fluctuating. And I often pondered what is in that, uh, whether there's some content to the light, why are they having magnetic disturbances? So I, it, when I was 13, I built a UFO detector uh, that comprised of a compass, a photo transistor and an LED. And what this did was if the compass was aimed at magnetic north, it would stay at magnetic north. But if something disturbs that compass, it would trigger an alarm. And uh, it, it's, uh, it was a thing that I in invented, uh, or I, I shouldn't say I, I invented because I think it was around you know, prior to when I, when I put it together. And it went off a few times. And I have a, an artifact. Uh, so let me describe what happened. This was a really strange thing. And I feel like I'm going out on a limb on this, but this is what really got me fired up on this was um, we had a ham radio antenna on the rooftop of our house. And my UFO detector, which would, would signal at any time, it went off one night at about one o'clock in the morning. And I woke up, I turned it off and went back to bed. I thought my circuitry is unstable. Maybe it just self triggered. And I went back to bed following night about one o'clock in the morning it went off again i turned i went back to bed i turned it off went back to bed and within a few days i noticed that the top section of our ham radio antenna was missing and i thought that's weird because uh, this thing's all bolted together, bolted together in tubular sections so i get a ladder get up on the rooftop and i find the top section is, has been pulled vertically so it was pulled in this axial direction stripping out the bolts that held it together. The bolts were twisted at an angle and uh, this thing was just ripped apart. I still have that antenna. And I looked at that, I'm going, well, that's not a natural phenomenon. Uh, it had no impact on the radio. The radio still worked. And, and so, so you couldn't say a lightning bolt did it. And how would you cause two sections of aluminum that were bolted together with bolts to be stripped out vertically? And I, I look at that phenomenon and I'm going that it was like it was, uh, you know, sort of a handshake, if you want to call it that. There was some phenomenon that had occurred. And, I, you know, I wasn't signaling or anything or I wasn't meditating or, or doing CE5. I was just reading the books and, and very intrigued about the phenomenon. And uh, it, that detector, by the way, it went off in 2003 at about the same hour and I woke up and I became overwhelmed with fear. So, because here's this opportunity, hey, it's, it, 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 you know, go outside and take a look. And I actually realized there was probably something outside and I didn't know what to expect. So I, I was afraid to go outside and I, tur I, I turned the thing off. So that's the kind of the events that got me interested, but I'll, I'll tell you the FLIR recordings happen purely by accident. So what, what happened with that was I had a, a thermal camera in my test lab at my company, and this was a, a thermal camera, the, a thermal camera that had a, um, a, a built-in cryogenically cooled detector. It was a $70,000 camera. And I took it home, hoping that I might be able to use it in long wave infrared um, 
astrophotography, you know, hooking it up to, say, a Newtonian telescope, I found that it really wasn't that effective based on the atmospheric attenuation factors. And then I thought, well, this would be kind of cool to um, use this camera to videotape a uh, commercial jet flying overhead. I, I just wanted to try it out. And this was in the afternoon. I remember it was May 3rd, 2005. And I, I'm panning the camera around and I image an object that I couldn't see. And there's actually two objects and they were very large, uh, occupying about five degrees of apparent field of view. So that's about the equivalent of holding your arm out at arm's length and spreading your hand. I looked straight up. I couldn't see a thing. And I had better than 20-20 vision at that time. And so I, I tracked it with the camera. I recorded them. And when I came back to review the videos, the two objects, according to the camera's calibrated temperature span, so this is the bar graph that you have in a camera that can tell you, you compare an object's um, hue or color to a specific portion of that calibrated temperature span to get a temperature readback, and it matched up to minus 30 Fahrenheit. Wow. Which was just very strange. <laughs> Cold and invisible, and they didn't make any sound. Uh, so it was funny. The next day I set up the camera. I got nothing but birds, bugs, and aircraft. And, and I thought, well, this is a once in a lifetime thing. It won't happen again. And a couple months later, I decided to try that camera while I was doing astrophotography. And when you do astrophotography, you're just setting exposures of a telescope. You're doing uh, like five minutes. You're looking at a computer monitor and you're looking at numbers for tracking and then checking your exposures every five minutes. And so you're not really looking at the sky. And while I was doing that, I had another thermal camera just running and recording in the sky. And then the next day I reviewed the videos and just was shocked at what I recorded. Objects that were V-shapes that were flying backwards that were very cold. Things that looked like serpents undulating in the sky. One that measured minus 70 Fahrenheit. I mean, it's just, I'm thinking this is crazy. And um, triangles and cylinders, just weird shapes. And Around here, had, right? Yeah, yeah, my own backyard. Yeah, yeah I've, you've seen some of those videos, Thomas. Yeah, like I have. And, well, I, I've just heard a lot more about, about different things, yeah, different shapes, you, well beyond it. Yeah. And I know I, I live some, in a but not the serpent. I live in an alleyway yeah. where, or uh, not an alleyway, it's it's a corridor, and mm -hmm. there are orange orbs that fly over my house or right over the neighbor's house across the street to the north of me. But I'm right in an alleyway where there's a bunch of UAP activity that goes on on a regular basis and they see it north of me, they see it south of me, they see it here, but there's something that's going on here where they're always going across those lines and I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, if you think about it, right, all forms of life, all forms of life have, have typical manners and pathways that they usually follow and go through things. And like all life, they're habit making and they'll always follow certain things when they're going to do certain trips or going to certain places, whatever it is, whatever it is, they'll follow the path like we have for flights and planes and possibly what we're seeing with UAP and other thing. And what you're observing, what I'm seeing here is that kind of a, you're on a, a Nate, it's not a nature path, but it's on a, a UAP flight pattern. It's, it's strange because, and there's been some years I got nothing. Uh, where I would set up my FLIR cameras and record for hours and hours and I'd review videos. And there were some years where I just skipped it because I, I'm thinking the, the, the game's off, they're not coming out or I'm not recording them. And if, if you do hundreds of hours and you're just recording nonsense of birds, bugs, yeah. and aircraft, you, yeah. you, get, you get bored. Um, but then when I, I picked it up again uh, intensely in 2016, and found out it was late to the party because I was catching things that were following aircraft or yeah. in front of aircraft. Uh, so it was um, recognizing. And it's everywhere. I just want to say you could try it in your yard or others. I set up at William Puckett's place when he lived in Bellevue. Yeah. And we we recorded a triangular object. He got to witness it for himself. Yep. And, and uh, God, Jim, I forget Jim's name. He's down in freaking... Uh, Tacoma, he's gotten triangles parked over his place and he's picked it up with the psionics like Tim has and what uh like Nikki has from the chat and everything. And uh uh I guess they are kind of everywhere, but it's it's a matter of I guess open opening people's eyes to the experience of what's out there and being able to, you know, um it's an awareness more than anything, isn't it? I, I, I suppose. Uh and, and what's interesting is 
the, the times where I've recorded it in daylight where I couldn't oh. see them with the naked eye. I remember what I was going to say. Vision. I just have to button really quick, Mr. ADD here really quick. I was going to say this before I forgot. One thing that Cheryl Costa had brought up, and she's got the big pink book of UFO sightings across the United States, statistics and Duvalva sightings across the United States. And what she had said out of all the data she's received, and I'd love to go ahead and double check with the times and when you were seeing this stuff for the sightings that you have, the Milky Way galaxy is an azimuth. It's between, you know, uh, sunrise, whatever you call it, the, the Milky Way galaxy, the core of it is overhead or it's within the spectrum of being overhead, uh, over, you know, within view when majority of the UFO sightings and things are actually happening. So there's something to do with. It could, it could be that uh, or, or the fact that more people are out in the summer months because what you'll have is... But sometimes it's way. in the middle of the day. Um, well, then that would counter that. But yeah. at night, I know that when you've got the star of Vega, at least here in the Pacific Northwest, that's that bright blue star yeah. in the summer months. And then you'll have Vega, Altair, and Deneb, and the Cygnus, the Swan, uh, in, and embedded in the Milky Way, uh, gal or Milky Way is it's our own galaxy. Uh, and then what's interesting is the Kepler telescope is pointed in an area of the sky that's between it's it, it's near Cygnus the Swan and Lyra the Harp, where they're imaging for planets and uh, well, whatever and, else they're looking for that they haven't told us. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that that has happened, and I think the real problem that happens is when somebody who's doing an analysis comes across some rather unusual data. They don't want to go out on a limb and say. Uh, we think this is ET or we think this isn't natural because when you work for the government, you don't want to lose your job. You don't want to lose your benefits. So you just kind of want to stay with the status quo on, you know, I'm just doing my data and I'm doing my job. Yeah. And I don't fault them for that because, it, you know, there's, there's things you don't do. And, it, and it's also just privacy concerns. They probably don't want to bring up the names of other people that they don't have permissions. Yeah. Or it's not necessarily permissions. It's something where you have just a respect like Lou has. If he promises someone, he's not going to talk yeah. about it to something. But I, I see uh, Tim's got his finger up there and then Tom. Yeah, um, I know that UFO is really a pretty hot topic in science fiction and film. And obviously art reflects life to an extent. And I guess my question is kind of to uh, Dave Altman for this one um there's there's some really good film coming out soon um and there's some pretty good documentaries that are being released um how do you feel this information being re released to the public now where we're getting interesting science fiction that's almost more science than fiction and then a lot of documentaries like your own um what do you think this movement is all about do you think this is a way of disclosing People have been speculating on that question for 70 years. You know, is this a controlled type of disclosure? Is it a drip drip? Um, I, you know, I'll, here's a, here's an example. Um, when I when I worked on the on the J.J. Abrams uh, series, um, you know, it was like any other job I've worked on any other show but when it came out there were so many theories and and like people jumping to conclusions that this was part of disclosure this is disinformation this was a psyop and it's like i actually kind of myself before i started working on these types of shows thought that but now that i'm kind of in the middle of it it's got nothing to do with it. It's about people, mostly uh, producers or directors that, you know, are either science fiction fans or they're, they're fans of, you know, hoping that they're, that ETs will be here someday. I, I, or their experiencers think, themselves I mean, even, right? Then again, Some of them. I could be in the dark. Yeah. Or, or yeah, good point. Or experiencers, it's so it's either, I mean, I don't know. I could be 
kind of having the wool pull, pulled over my eyes as well by these people. But from what I know and from what I've worked on, only only thing that I've ever heard the government having anything to do with anything that I've worked on. And I don't think I've said this in, a, in an interview before, but I'll go ahead and tell the story. So I, I was developing a series um, for a production company. And the idea was that uh, it wasn't really an idea, but it was the fact of how a lot of people in the Christian community and even non-Christian community felt that aliens could be demons. And we started working on this, on this idea about how to do it for about a month. And a month and a day later, I got an email saying the show has been scrubbed. And I didn't really get a reason until a couple of weeks later, the producer told me, you know, quietly that they got a phone call from somebody in the government and they said, shut it down because they don't, they didn't want the world or whoever, you know, the, the population of the U S or whoever saw the show. To well, it's not that they can actually think it. You got to take an advantage, so, right? If you ever heard about the book called the Adam and Eve story by Chan Thomas, it came out in the 50, I believe it was in the fifties or sixties and it was taken off the market by the CIA. And what was it talking about? It was talking about the history of catastrophe catastrophes that have been found in the geological record that go back every 14, 28,000, 36,000 years going back in time. Right. And they didn't want that information to come out and they took it off the market, prevented it. Look at what happened with the Bernoulli Bernstein, uh, comet that's out there right now. They discovered that in 2014 and they couldn't tell it to, tell us about it until 2022, let alone that asteroid that impacted the planet. That was a inner, uh, interstellar object that came and hit it hit, hit us head on like it was launched from a from a cannon not from a regular asteroid and they classified that from 2014 until 2022 as well so we've got this history of the government taking things that are actually factual or rooted in part of a something well we don't want the people to think about that because well that's actually what's happening behind the scenes you just gotta you can't always trust the government and put you know the least amount of concern of what it could possibly be but maybe look at the options face on which could be that you guys stumbled into a dialogue that the government doesn't want people to talk about because it could potentially be a dialogue that has weight to it or just scare people I mean, the whole thing is just another another rabbit hole, you know, because it is a known fact that the government does have its hand in movies. I mean, look at the new Top Gun movie. Where do you think all that military footage and all that stuff? Eleven thousand dollars an hour from to rent those planes, Force, you know. And uh, I, I think it was in the the nineties. Tom, Tom, do you remember uh, Chase I don't Brandon? Recall that name. So Chase Brandon was allegedly a uh, CIA guy, and his job was he was the liaison to Hollywood. Um, and he had come out in the, I think, the late 80s or 90s and said, Sorry. well, and said, you know, um, yeah, you know, it's a drip drip. They're doing this to get the people used to the idea of E.T. and so forth. And Yeah, the whole Independence you know, so, Day movie, they, they screwed it's possible. with that. They said, well, you can use our military jets for your plane, but you got to get that Area 51 shit out of the script. And they said, we can't. That's part of the plot to Independence Day. They have data there, and he's back engineering it. And then they said, okay, we'll CGI the planes. Remember hearing about that? <laughs> They're directly screwing with yeah. scripts. So it's it's – in a way, kind of like uh, Russia brainwashing its people or Iran or China brainwashing their people. We have our own U.S. style. They, they were heavily Propaganda. involved in the X-Files as well. Right. Well, I mean, I, I, you, in some, some shows, I get it. I mean, I can understand a show... Um, something like a show like The Blacklist or some some criminal, you know, like uh, spy show having a CIA li liaison, but to have a CIA, CIA liaison on 
a, sh- a movie about aliens, we're never going to know if he's there to to push the push a narrative or if he's there just to tell people how. The yeah, but you've got going. someone we'll, who was. We'll never know. Even if they came out and told us. But still, you have someone us, who anyway. had enough influence and enough weight to say, "Shut it down. We don't want it to happen." It was either a story that was told you as an excuse, or it's something that truly did happen. Or it was told to me, so I would go out and tell people like <laughs> you guys. Yes. What year did that happen, Dave? Uh, it was last year. Was it for wow. Fox by any chance? Fox Network? Okay. No. Because what did you know? I do know that when Disney bought Fox, the whole enchilada pretty much, uh, me and my wife were watching something on Fox. It was an, uh, with Gina Davis. It was some satanic um, church it was the Exorcist sequel TV series, and they were getting big. Yeah, that was oh, pretty yeah, that cool. Was when show. it got good, Disney canceled it because they said we don't want no Satan stuff under our brand. So there's always weird factors swimming in the mix of a bunch of variables of weird things that happen. Yeah, but that's that's a little bit different than making people possibly think that. You know, the reality, you know, here they are saying UFOs are real, and now we're saying but, the demons. But, but hey, <laughs> that's a little bit but different. you got to remember, people it was initially out, said that people in the Pentagon who were uh, Thomas, people Thomas, in the Pentagon who went and Thomas. said that, if you want to call it, that when they ran Jim Lekatsky out of the Pentagon at the time of whatever he was involved in, whatever was going on, is because some of the answers that we're getting on, it was, if you want to call this religious right within the within the Department of Defense itself, that did classify this stuff. And think of it as demons and such, right? You're on you're on fire, Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You mean the Air Force? The ones that don't have any rules? No, uh they they the the they don't really have a name. They're a think tank. Um some some people call them like the Collins elite. There's two there's two factions. There's one there's one faction that wants to weaponize the phenomena and will do anything it can to summon these things, and then there's another faction who thinks that if you if you research UFOs, you're summoning Satan and you're gonna cause the apocalypse. Oh, wow. And that's that's and those are the two the sides that tip was shut down allegedly yes there's one side there's one side that started uh after um yeah 1950 they start they started looking into jack parsons and all that stuff he was doing uh read read a book called finally vents yeah. by nick redford absolutely that'll, that'll tell you well then let tim add that to the list <laughs> yeah. As I'm seeing you're going and grabbing for us. Thank you. Yeah. Some amazing stuff, Rob. I mean, not Rob, uh, David, this is just kind of a situation I haven't heard a lot of. And man, it just opens up your, our view of you of how you see things from a phenomena aspect and more importantly of the inner workings of some of the things that are, have brought us to where we're at today. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I, um, I haven't talked about this stuff. You know, I really did, haven't done interviews in a while until the movie came out, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff I've been sitting well, on. Well, there's a lot of things I you said, hey, Thomas, watch this, or hey, Thomas, check this out and everything. And of all the different people that I know who have a lot of experience in different things and uh, research with to a huge, you know, understanding the huge knowledge base of all the different things that have happened in the past, and more importantly, how you're saying today, how it relates to the exopolitics of what we're getting in this fourth branch of the government that we have that has no accountability, no oversight, and as Congress is trying to swoop in, they're freaking out and trying to kill people in the process and kill programs. It, it's... uh. Yeah, yes, it, absolutely. I, I would say that to the least. Uh, um, Tim. <laughs> yes, I do have a question. <laughs> you know, you can tell. Um, back to Dave Mason, actually. I was wondering, um, Dave, would you be willing to talk about what you're currently working on? I know you're working on tech, but um, is that is that That's in the no-go zone. You can't really get into? I, I, I can't get into um, okay. a, a project there, but... 
Okay, hey, go for real it. Quick, yeah, Dave. Real quick. Sorry, guys. I just want to. I just want to say. Oh, oh Mr. Doty is back Doty. again. Awesome. Ah, good to see you, Doty. I haven't, I haven't not been here. watching the chat close enough. Yes, there he is, Mr. Rick Doty. Good book. Yes, absolutely. Cool. Well, okay, so you can't talk about what you're going to work on. Then let's mm -hmm. um, talk about my favorite part of the film, which is um, near the end when you you are, I believe, looking over data and discover that you perhaps had captured a tear in the sky where the the synchronicity must have just blown everyone's mind seeing this that the title of the film was being realized in front of your right. eyes in data but so that's a that sends chills so please yeah, so Who I, I'm, I'm just gonna say i'm just gonna say one thing uh i don't know right. if it's a wormhole i don't know if it's a portal i don't know if it's i don't know what it was what it is but it's true that the name of the movie, A Tear in the Sky, was yeah. called that before oh, cool. we even started Incredible. filming the yeah. movie. So, you know, it could be a party destination. We just don't know. We <laughs> could be, hey, it is the west coast of California, you know, great surfing. Yeah. Just, you know, what you, would you two, Dave's, recommend for, like, teachers out there watching or professors or the next scientists that want to walk in your shoes? that live say in dallas or austin or portland or florida how would they set up their own uapx in uh, their area or how like let's say mufon wasn't a lost cause and they actually did <laughs> stuff they did shit before shit happens instead of debunking shit after shit happens is there right. any way you can fix that or, or what do you recommend for people to try out what you're doing and do their own I would science? I would start it depends on what your budget is I mean so your your first start is to you know get off the internet stop playing on the internet uh, when you have a clear sky get a recliner chair a thermos of a warm beverage or a cold one and stare at the sky get familiar with satellites and meteors they're fun to watch and then if your next level of budget would be buy some 7x50 binoculars, spend at least $100 or more. Don't buy the cheap stuff that has plastic lenses or the lenses that look red in color. Uh, those are plastic lenses. Go so to a secondhand store and look for a good pair cheap. Yeah, a good pair. You know, in, 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 you know I'm using uh, Fujinon 7x50s. These are the FM TRSX. They're, I, you, know, you can buy them used or new. New, they're about $800. Um, but they, you know, seven by fifties will give you a bright exit pupil. So when you're looking at the night sky, your pupils dilate to seven millimeters. So that's why the seven by fifties are best for for night viewing. And then if the next level you'd want to go to, okay, what kind of device can I use to record? Well, you could use your iPhone, but you, you do have some limited sensitivity. You may want to consider a night vision, a CCD night vision recording device. And there are several manufacturers of that. Uh, some of those are claimed to be, you know, Gen 2, Gen 3 technology, but that's solid state. It isn't Gen 2 or Gen 3. It's just a way of marketing that product. That's the next level. You're going to be spending between four and $800 to a, maybe $1,000 for those devices. And then if you want to get to real night vision, I recommend using at least Gen 2 or Gen 3 or Gen 3 Plus. And, and then that can get kind of spendy because you're going to start somewhere between 2,500 for a, a Gen 2, and when you're in Gen 3, you're 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 at 3,500 on up. And uh, there's two different phosphors that are available. There's the white phosphor, the P45, and then there's the red, the green phosphor, P43. The white phosphor, in my opinion, is more of a fad. It's not as photo responsive as the green phosphor. Uh, and you pay more for the white phosphor. I re really recommend stick with the green phosphor. You'll get better results in the lowest light situations. Um, and then that would be the next level for if you've got that kind of a budget, because if certainly if you pan the skies with, with this type of Gen 2 or Gen 3 technology, you're going to see a lot more stuff that's anomalous than just with your naked eye or with binoculars. And then if you really want to spend crazy money, you get into thermography and video recorders and uh, you can go many tens of thousands of dollars investing in that. If you can get something secondhand that is uh, from a, uh, a credible source so you don't end up buying junk, you know, then that would be the next level uh, that I would recommend. But, I, you know, I think that the center 
portion would be getting a pair of Gen 2 night vision goggles so you could get something that's a few thousand dollars and you will really be surprised at the performance of that. Uh, don't buy Gen 1. Uh, Gen 1 is uh, stuff that came out back in the 60s. It's, I, you know, I had one in, in I, I would look through it and I, I would think, you know, I think I could see better with my own eyes than this Gen 1. It was just really didn't have that much image intensify. And then Gen 2, they added the, um, what they call the micro channel plate or was a uh, electron multiplier that really made that thing boom in sensitivity. But do, I recommend people to start their own research, you know, get together with friends, do sky watches, uh, get familiar with the night sky, the constellations, the, the seeing conditions, and spend enough time. And when you watch satellites, it's a good, a good thing to actually watch it as it transits the field of view because, you know, it'll just move at a constant velocity. But if that satellite suddenly changes trajectory or reverses or accelerates or decelerates, that's not a satellite. And that's the stuff that gets to be exciting when you witness something like that, if you witness it with your eyes or with night vision. Yeah, uh, yeah I'd like to see schools out there start uh, getting a budget for some of this stuff. I think a lot of us he are here today and a lot of people in the chat because of our school's public library. That when mm -hmm. we were kids, we were forced to do book reports all the time. And our schools had a certain area of books and we went to the coolest section there was, the sharks, mm -hmm. the UFOs, the pyramids, the Loch Ness yeah. Monster, Bigfoot, all that stuff, and wrote reports on it and became, wrote and read every book in our library and became many UFO experts at the time, and we didn't even if know. If I it. can interject on this, what we need is a education program for kids in machine, lear uh, machine learning to go ahead and be able to take the images that are coming in one frame at a time and perform analysis and track motion and start with it looking at from a technical uh, aspect of how can we take these frames from a digital aspect to be able to watch motion, to be able to discern things, to be able to learn about what's going out there and have something that can be shared around a bunch of people. It's building that knowledge set of having the basic tools. And a lot of the stuff isn't that difficult to get. You just need a data feed that you can process and be able to blow, you know, get rid of the blacks and make the whites bright and big and everything. And then from there, like you were saying, Dave, it's the, it's the patterns that you see of a satellite and the patterns that you see of other things that you can start classifying. When, but when you start seeing other patterns that don't go ahead and belong with it, that's where, it, that's where you can get special. And that's where even dealing with some of your uh, stuff coming up from thermal, it's looking at how can you take that stuff, bring it in through a pipeline and be able to process it and let, system do the work for you through uh you know a knowledge signal bank. recognition yeah yeah right yeah and that and that's you can do that either visually or using softwares where you're 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 taking layers and you're you're comparing ratios and it that, that can work to some degree and then the visual it seems like both processes whether you're doing it visual uh reviewing or using software they have their pluses and minuses um but what I'm trying to get at here is I think a lot of people who are interested in this phenomenon, they're, they're often very busy. So they're, you know, they get done with their work shift. So they go and click and see what's the latest and greatest. And they look at what other people are doing. And I'm really trying to suggest to others is not so much follow what I do or others develop your own, uh, your own sky watches and do it. Because I think this is the real problem with the phenomena that we don't have enough people looking at the night sky and paying attention to what's above us. And if people did that, there would be more of a preponderance of the evidence to support it. I mean, I, mean, I would estimate maybe, I, I don't know what the stats are, maybe you guys would know, but what, what how many people in, you know, globally or in the US have said, I've witnessed a UFO? You know, I'll say maybe it's 10% of the population. And that is, you know, not gonna be convincing from a science standpoint, but if you had, uh, you know, 90% because people took the time and, and watched the skies, then the preponderance of the evidence would support. No, we, we need a low cost appliance that'll do that for us. <laughs> yeah. And it's getting, you know, price points are coming down on thermal cameras, but yeah. uh, I'll just have to say the consumer grade cameras are, are, you know, for doing like building inspections or searching for Bigfoot, they're fine, but video, they're not. They're not I've got to bring this up. 
there are a bunch of people who have the wise cameras gen 2 and gen 3 it's an ir camera and mm -hmm. different parts of the country when these things are going they're picking up these things that are moving around in different kinds of you know hey thomas yes sir hey bob birkins you're really pissing me off tonight oh oh bob behave bob <laughs> oh i see here bob let's do uh -oh. this bob your moderator has been pulled if you do shit more you can get spanked I'm not gonna kick you out but you are spankable at this point so i have waved I, I, the wand of the I, magic I like screwdriver the don't make me turn it in you like i'm adjusting the back of a cat I would like to like to share my analogy as to why the phenomenon itself has so much difficulty. And, and I can relay this to dreams. Everybody experiences nocturnal dreams. If, if I say I had a dream and I said, hey, this crazy stuff happened in the dream, most people will say, oh, yeah, I understand, because we all have dreams and it has information in it that can be shared. But that's something I can't prove. I can't prove I had a dream. In fact, science can't prove dreams exist. Yeah, it, you could hook up, uh, uh, you know, electrodes to my body and see muscles moving while I'm sleeping. And, and we could assume I'm having a dream, but that's just an observation of biological reactions. But that's not proof of a dream. And so the fact that the majority of the world population can recall their dreams, the preponderance of the evidence, it makes it accepted within science. But science fails to prove that they exist. So uh, it's, it, shows, it shows that science itself is flawed. Now, what if only 10% of the world population could recall their dreams and the 90% couldn't? What would happen to that 10% who said, hey, I, I had this nocturnal experience where I was in a different place and I went into a building and then I was floating or whatever. You know, we always have these crazy dreams. That 10% of the population would be judged as uh, mentally disabled, as having some sort of a nocturnal disorder requiring medications that cause hair loss and, and diarrhea and heart attacks and death. But you're supposed to take this because you have these nocturnal dreams. That is what our, how we would treat that sector of the society if only 10% could recall their dreams. They wouldn't be pre understood as having some kind of a skill set or anything. And that's, that's the problem with the phenomenon is that we have about 10% of the population saying, I experienced something or I witnessed something. And you have the 90% who say, well, we didn't experience, so therefore it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's always the doubters. It's the people who can look into something and find a way to disprove stuff, trying to look at something and trying to look at it and say, wow, it looks like a can. It feels like a can, you know, it cuts like a can and everything. But they just want, again, the people who are out there to take anything. And if it doesn't fit the exact model of the box, of what you know goes in it they want to take it and throw it outside the box and that's the biggest thing where i am i've been saying lately let's take the box and throw it away and act like it doesn't exist because otherwise you're not going to be thinking and looking at it in the way that you're doing because we have all these preconceived notions of how we can do things and build it and if you go outside of it well you're you know what are you doing right yeah, and you have to do that. You have to think outside the box in there. And that's how I've had success in my life and in business or, or coming up with ideas and building things and just knowing the tools are there, uh, the materials are there. It's just a matter of crafting it together. Yeah, absolutely. Tom? <laughs> well, uh, Tim asked um, Dave a question earlier if he, would, if he was asked before Congress if he'd testify. The dude from Area 51, a recruiter, came and said, we've got some some saucers parked in the back. We want you to work on them. Would, would that, you'd be down for that? I know I would. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I would be cautious because what if this thing was highly radioactive and they didn't want to subject one of their own? So pick this random guy, you know, and see what happens to him. <laughs> so um, I would be Dave, somewhat Dave. cautious. You're too smart for that. You're not a red shirt guy from Star Trek. You're blue <laughs> or yellow, not red. I did. Bob, yes, I, Bob in the chat, he's a red shirt. <laughs> I I saw a, 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 there was a red shirt guy in Star Trek that didn't get killed. I don't remember which episode, but I remember there was one. I was looking at it because I kept Oh, watching. here we go. 
I, I, here we go. <laughs> I thought he was going to get killed, but he didn't get killed. So it, maybe they edited that part out. But I don't. Um, I don't know if that would really be the case because the approach on such a thing, if you had it, you'd have to be first looking for radiation and then looking at broad spectrum oh, RF. Oh, radiation! You, know, you bring up the stuff. One of the things I think that was brought up that you guys brought uh, had uh, mentioned on. It, at least it was mentioned in, in some of the stuff in A Terror in the Sky, with, there was a spike in gamma radiation or something to that extent before <laughs> some of the things that happened. Was that in one of the Is observations? There Is there a uh, no, that, that, they, they hit? that would just be the energy level that was recorded. Now, that was recorded by Matthew's uh, radiation detector with right. data log. I don't right. have that data. I also want to bring up is I don't have the data on the CCD imagery of the uh, the you know the dark zone in the sky, so I I can't comment on it and say you know offer any analysis on it because oh wow you I, don't have that that's odd no no I actually stayed uh, off of that well because I knew I had so much to look at with thermal thermal cameras and I figured you know you got two PhDs to look at that let them handle that. And and they could run with that and make their analysis on it. So I was sticking with the FLIR. They were still helping me with vetting the the videos, and and so there was some support on that. But I had an over you know 600 hours of over 600 hours of FLIR video to review. Yeah. And so that was that was really an arduous task. If you break that down in time and how much that is, it, it, and having to go when you review stuff, you're you're going fast forward a little, but then you got to rewind and recheck. Oh, and come on. We, I, we need to work together on some uh, 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 learning models on for an image yeah, and, uh, for that, video we're, analysis we're, and this yeah, kind of stuff. We're, we're, yeah, yeah. And, and Matthew was actually uh, running that process on it. So he, he discovered a few things that I missed it. And, and then I discovered things that his software missed. So yeah. it's all, you know, you kind of have to. Well, it, it's process. a model that evolves over time and it's about you with the expertise you have being able to take the stuff that you have and be able to, you could sit there and actually ana analyze it, but it's being able to take mm -hmm. it where you've got your skills of how you look at things. And as you're going through it, being able to pick out some of the different stuff, which means that first you have to watch it with it, but then it just goes and does its own. And then I think what, what people don't understand is um, much of the skill sets, like what I'll have in analyzing video, it's only because I have reviewed, thousands of hours yeah. of video and 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 so you know yeah I did, I did design a, a thermal camera that has a different function but you still have to have the experience of recording bugs and birds and aircraft oh, yeah. and getting familiar with it and i'm sure tom king you know had his share of having thousands of hours of of looking at garbage you know that you know things that just wasted his time but then he gets that one diamond in the rough where you've got something that isn't a bug it isn't a bird it isn't a garbage bag it isn't a balloon it's not an airplane and you you get that so you you really hone in your your observational skills yeah and you know it's like i i when i was a kid i was about uh six seven years old where i started working in astronomy and just going outside yeah. with the telescope and built my own little newtonian telescope and right so it it you it, when you get that kind of experience you really know how to differentiate between right. you know the pros I know that's why I mean they would just take the right. exact I hate to quote Microsoft I'm going to kill myself for doing this but I'll say it anyway <laughs> a machine learning model is a file that has been trained to recognize or a system that's been trained to recognize certain types of patterns you can train mm -hmm. a model over a set of data providing it an algorithm it can use to reason and learn over those data so it's about being able to have data that's getting fed into it and as you have different data types, a bug, a fly, a uh, mosquito, whatever it would be that would go flying past it, or a mm -hmm. triangle craft or an orb or a squiggly thing or different kinds of stuff that are within the same types of images that are passing through it, you can go ahead and go through a training uh, and be able to train the system to how to recognize. And it's not just looking for the shapes. But in your case, it's looking for the motion and the sizing change over it to help you recognize, is it coming close? Is it going farther away? And just be able to take it and just be able to imagine you've got those 12 cameras or whatever it is that are going. And as the video is going on, you used to have a system that's just going there and chunking through it and being able to say, mm -hmm. hey, look at this spot or, hey, double check this spot so you don't have to scrub and find it. And then as you find those spots, you can further train and say, hey, 
this is what this is and this is what that is. So it basically mm -hmm. takes the concept of dealing with a lot of data because if you're going to be having a lot of these systems out there for people to, for locations to go ahead and do it, it's how do you get stuff in an economy of scale with the knowledge you have using with the type of data that you're having coming in with it, but just applying that latest, greatest technology systems that we have because our CPUs are so strong. I'm just looking at it from a right. automation uh, not not meaning to go ahead and discount anything that you have, because honestly, your observations and knowledge going through this would be used to train your system. And then it's just something to mm -hmm. add into it. And as you're expanding out and doing more things in this, it's being able to take what David Mason does and just scale it under your control. Yeah, there, there's, there's one thing that I'm doing with the therm, thermal cameras is that I am using cameras that have passive temperature measurement capability. Yeah. And even though there's some skewing of that because you've got object emissivity, if it's, is it reflecting heat, is it emitting heat? So there's, there's some variables to it. But what I find is that most of the objects that I record are measuring very cold yeah. against a black background sky. And oftentimes they're, interesting. they're like minus 40 Fahrenheit. I've had one down, it was minus 80 Fahrenheit. So they're going to show up in a yeah. data set of temperatures going over something and where those kind of va yeah. variations, you can easily tell the system, look, just look at this whole grid, one grid after the other, after the other, and watch for this. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you get stuff that, that's just above a certain temperature threshold, just just toss it because it's likely to right. murder a bug for a commercial aircraft. Yeah. So that, those are the things that I find that qualify and differentiate it. And, uh, you know, it was one question that was brought to me in, when I was on Coast to Coast with Carolyn Corey. A guy uh, called in and he was asking about, you know, the emissivity. And I related to him that the objects are cold. And, and what makes it interesting is that if you have a commercial jet flying overhead, and it may be at 35,000 feet altitude. It may be in a cold environment, but it's going to reflect the temperature of the earth back to the thermal camera like a mirror. So you'll get a, a very high temperature of that aircraft. And then if I'm recording objects that are very cold, that would suggest then that they're a black bodied aircraft or a craft that right. has a, uh, it, it's a cold temperature craft. Well, the problem with that then, it could be indicating its environment. And if it's indicating its environment, it's at very high altitude. Well, then if we know the altitude, I know the camera aspect ratio and I can do trigonometry and calculate size. And they come out to be very unusual in, in scale. Uh, for example, I had William Puckett from UFOs and W. He's a retired meteorologist. So he knows his stuff about altitudes and temperatures. We had an object that I, I think it was minus 70 Fahrenheit or minus 75. And um, he said, well, that's at 90,000 feet. And so I did some trigonometry and calculated that the, the apparent size of the object within the field of view indicated that the object measured 2,200 feet across, which is almost half a mile, which is, it's too big, you know? So it doesn't is it too big? Like, Ask Tom King on that one. Was that a boomerang shape by chance? <laughs> no, it, it was a, it, it was a V-shaped object. It was a V-shape. Oh, the that's same close. thing, boomerang V, v? but, but. Yeah, it Excellent. wasn't open ended or it was a it? chevron shape. Chevron was it piloted no, by a uh, wicked looking female it, alien it, called it, by the name of Diana? It had no te uh, other temperature gradients. There was no propulsion. There was no fuselage. So it was like a, uh, a chevron shape object. Yeah. That, like five that dots. Kind of uh, no, this was a solid solid mass. Oh wow! Uh, wow. That that moved across. And was very cold and so we came up to that determination and that is if it's indicating its environment uh now the other thing that could be they could be smaller and they're just lower mass like more translucent so much of the uh, their heat is not actually uh being transferred to the thermal camera it's, it's a lot of questions that come up but i i don't really have answers i just know the data is very interesting now if these things were hot and were the temperature of conventional aircraft then I would think, okay, this could be somebody's flying many uh, black project aircraft over my, uh, uh, you know, my house, which I know is highly controlled airspace. I've, I've flown a Cessna 172 over my house when I was taking flight flying lessons, and I know how highly controlled the airspace is in this vicinity. So when someone and, says, and what oh, are the height flying. of these objects again? Uh, well, one was uh, estimated based on it. We're just talking about one particular video. It was uh, estimated by William Puckett, the meteorologist, 
that it was at 90,000 feet elevation. And then I just did the trigonometry knowing the camera field of view. You can calculate the size of an object based on known distance. Sorry, yeah. And that's and, it, and so it, we came up with 2,200 feet. Yeah, sorry about and, that. I just had to double check again because 90,000 yeah, so feet, 2,200 feet across, holy. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, well. And, it doesn't make any yeah, sense with the perceived understanding of everything that's going on there. But if it walks like a duck, squawks like a duck, mm -hmm. and is it visible like a duck? Yeah. Yeah. No matter what you it's do with the, the duck. So in, in thermography, you know, we, we consider emissivity, which is, you know, what, you know, if it's a black object, it's going to be uh, emissivity of one. If it's highly reflective, it's emissivity of zero. No matter you, where you place that object in the emissivity scale or reflectance, uh, you can't explain the phenomena I recorded. That's what I was trying to explain to this guy in, uh, who, who called in on coast to coast. I don't think he liked my answer because I think he really just wanted to try to debunk me, but he didn't expect me to have an answer. Right. Dave, have you managed to record with any of your gear any of the newer phenomenon that we're now discovering, such as thermal vortices or plasma? Uh, not that I'm aware of, although there is an anomaly that was recorded that I re that it was actually the thing that interested me the most in the movie A Terror in the Sky was the object that appeared where it was sort of a maroon color understand that thermal cameras in color, it's false color, it's just for contrast purposes. Um, but it, it was colder than the surrounding environment. We had an object appear, I think it was in about nine frames, and it seemed to rotate and change, and then it disappeared, it faded out. And to have something appear as colder and then disappear was just phenomenal to me, because if it was a like a, just a single pixel, where you got, say, a hot pixel that was triggered by a cosmic ray, and that happens in CCD cameras all the time where you get uh, you know, a speckle, a white speckle that'll just appear. Or if you just have a, a resident hot pixel, uh, you don't have cold pixels where they get colder momentarily and then they resume to acting normal or behaving normal and there's, there's no other activity. So I can rule out camera artifact. That to me was, was really, really strange because I've never recorded something where it was colder than its background temperature. Uh, it's always been just slightly above background temperature. Yeah. Very interesting. But, Thank yeah. you. And, and again, you know, it'll be interesting to know if on these cameras of which we're recording besides an optical output, is there a serial data output where you can get the data of each frame coming along with it, not coming out with just its pixel representation of color, but actually getting the temperatures of what it's sensing. And then if you had something like that, pumping that into a, that would go along with the video of what you're getting, that's something that could also make it easier. But, you know, doing RGB value, be able to find colors and stuff. I used to make, I'll admit, I used to make 2D video games back in the day. You know, when we had 8-bit system, handheld systems like the Atari Lynx and, uh, gosh, Game Boy Black and White and uh, the Sega Game Gear and all these little handheld color systems. So we had bunches of tools back in the day for doing pixel analysis and being able to cut out objects, recognize patterns do optimal chopping of the object. So just all of that kind of skills and tech, I'll bring, go back to it again. For me, it's just second nature. And that's the only reason I've been bringing it up saying, well, we've got all this other stuff here. You've got these different things. Let's find a way to connect the data, get into the systems and just give you something and plug it into it and it's set and forget it. That's just me looking at it from a technology production pipeline. Yeah, and, and but you know, here's the problem with the phenomenon. So even if I refine this to where I'm getting data repeatedly, it's still not going to convince everybody because you've got people who are you know forget, very you know forget about them. Yeah, they're they're religiously founded, so they're not going to accept data. But I, I mean, if, if you had a uh, the Hollywood experience where a, a, a saucer lands and people walk out and greet and say we're here to make the world better or worse or whatever. I, you would still have about half the population saying it's not real, it's a shadow, or it's CGI, or this is some government. I don't think it'd be up, half. You know? I think you're going to get that staunch, maybe 20%, 30%. But we're already it's kind of at that 50% mark, and we're moving beyond it. Yeah, it, it, it'll always be there. I mean, it, it's just, that's just the nature of the game. And yeah. you're, you're always going to have the people who believe everything and then the people who don't believe anything. That's just always going to be. There. I know, I but that... luckily we're going to be in something. I think everyone can mm -hmm. agree. We're going to be moving beyond something. That's just, I want to believe. 
I want to yeah, have faith I, in this. We're going to have something I, where there's actual factual evidence on what's going on. And people could say that, well, I don't believe that. And well, it's like, well, trust me. I got to ask you the question. What kind of stuff do yeah, you really it, believe? Yeah, they, it, but it's also the phenomenon that, that at least what I'm picking up in FLIR may be um, uh, nothing more than uh, a natural phenomenon that we just haven't discovered. You know, so, sort of like when the first microscope user found that there were little critters swimming in, in mud or, or you know, yeah. swamp water. And, and that person was laughed at when they said, well, there's little microorganisms. Oh, no, they, they don't exist because we can't see them. And, uh, you know, we've had in science, we've had so many things that have been disregarded. Uh, we've had uh, physicists saying that black holes didn't exist, renowned physicists, you know, the, the big authorities of, of physics. Yeah, and they were proven wrong. So this is um, one of the problems we have in this phenomenon. And we, we often have Hollywood physicists, you know, pontificating their beliefs in what they say is right and factual. And, and people just accept them because they're in Hollywood. But they, the real physicists and scientists doing the real work are the ones who are, who are not self-promoting. They are just doing the research. And, and it's, it's just contaminating this whole process. And then if they're destabilized, you know, they're, they're not going to want to end their careers by conceding and saying, hey, we, uh, you know, we were debunking this phenomenon, but now we're seeing some more evidence that is conclusive on the matter. Yeah. Tim? I do have a, a question concerning hotspots. Um, Dave's, um, between the two of you guys, um, what do you think really makes a hotspot and, and what would potentially attract UAP to a hotspot? I, I'm going to say water. Uh, oceans, lakes, deep lakes, um, granites. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of because of the higher radioactivity or something, there just seems to be some correlations to that. Uh, is it and, magnetic ma magnets? Yeah, um, water, uh, and often, oftentimes, I think areas that are more secluded, uh, you might have. So maybe water because, because they can hide underneath it easily. It just seems like there's a lot of uh, reports of things going in and out of water, the ocean, uh, Lake Erie. I, I, yeah, and also another one that. Uh, because of what I do in thermography, I think they are also near aircraft and airports. And, uh, and I picked up objects that, that were trailing commercial jets or in front of commercial jets that I've recorded. And they're anomalous because they're much, much colder than the commercial jet. And that's, and their, their shape is also often very odd looking. It doesn't look anything like a, a conventional craft. And so those are the things that, I think are part of the elements uh, of it, but I, I think water is a real big thing with the phenomenon. Yeah. My guess is they like to hide underneath it to get away <laughs> from the potential right. humans. Cause it makes it's, it's not readily accessible and easily accessible to get down to the bottom wherever it is. Right. Yeah. And we have limited technology because you can't, you know, for water, it, it attenuates wavelengths effectively if you drop a camera down, you usually can only see maybe 50 feet in front of you. And then even if you try to use a night vision, it doesn't really get any farther. FLIR is useless underwater. It totally traps those wavelengths. So um, the only things we're really left with is sonar or maybe an RF pulse. And if we go in water, we can't, we can't use these devices because, I mean, we could use them, but if we're trying to pursue something that's underwater, and we're sending out a beacon or a signal to try to detect them. We're, we're sending out the message we're approaching. So if anything is down there, it'll scatter. So it, not likely right. we'll be able to approach it. Right. And um, DA, what it, what's your opinion? Do you have anything to add to hotspots and your experience? Ditto. Okay. Of what Mason awesome. just said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay, but but you know, you also can add in there historical. Uh, maybe, um, you know, just an example, when I, before we went out to Catalina, I did a lot of research on, on the area and, um, found a lot of reports that go back to World War II and, and before. So there's something else you can look for is, is previous yeah. activity in the historical records. Um, do you also kind of buy the theory, which is shared by a lot of researchers that, uh, military and nuclear um installations and the activity in those areas often attract 
I mean, it, it, it makes sense, you know, that they they would be looking at our defenses or just looking at our at our capabilities to see where we are as a society technologically, yeah. you know, or or to go even further. What if these things are from here? What if they've always been here? Yeah. Uh, I think they would want to know if we were capable of blowing right. ourselves up along with them. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, could I ask also, Dave, while you're there, um, Dave Altman, um, was what was your experience interacting with um, the gear that Dave Mason invented? Because obviously he understands it, um, but actually putting it into operation as a researcher is a different thing. So you were left with all of his tech. And so I guess my question is, um, how, how did that uh, work? Actually, it wasn't really that bad because all we had, because of the way that we were doing the investigation with the triangulation and everything on Catalina Island, all we had was regular night vision goggles, generation two, generation three, and gotcha. and the big eyes. The, the, I mean, and, you know, honestly, if I were to go back out there again, I would want the same thing, but to be able to record because out of all of us, out of the whole team, uh, there was only a couple of us that actually saw anything uh, that yeah. wasn't on a, on a monitor. You know, I was able yeah, to- I want to point out, out the Gen 2. The what reason why I, I had Gen 2 supplied is it has sensitivity in the ultraviolet spectrum or amplifies more efficient in ultraviolet than the Gen 3 technology or Gen 3 plus. It just has to do with the photocathode material. So that was the reason why I was bringing in the two technologies. And just very quickly, Dave um, Mason, how do you feel about psionics technology? Are you pretty happy with some of the information being received by that gear? Um, now, there's, there's, I guess there's some debate about the uh, the psionics cameras. There's the, um, there's, there's different generations of it, and I've seen video demonstrations of, of the comparisons. I, I didn't see a whole lot of big differences between the more expensive versions or the cheap one. I happen to have the the cheap one, which is the Cyanex Aurora. I think I paid, I think I paid four hundred dollars for it, and it works pretty well. Uh, it is 720p resolution. Um, it uh, people are trying to say that it has the capability of performing at Gen two or Gen three uh, image intensifier night vision. That is not true. I've I've compared them. I mean, if you're under like a full a full moon night, you know, yeah, you could say it's comparable to it. But if you take away the moon and you go into an area where it's pitch black skies, the uh, Gen 2, Gen 3 night vision will way outperform what the Sinex can do. Now, with the Sinex, what I do like about it is you can do instant record. You, you Whatever you're looking at, you can record. It goes to a, an SD card. And I've, I've recorded some interesting things with it. I was going to post a video soon where I ran my Sinex camera on the sky just sky fishing for, uh, I was wanting to record meteorites uh, just to catch it in the Sinex. And I, I got some other interesting things that appeared. They weren't anomalous shapes, but they were objects that were too fast to be satellites and too slow to be meteorites. And I got seven of them. And I'm going to be posting that video shortly on YouTube. Wow. Um, so it, I think for the price point of the Sinex camera, it's a lot of bang for the buck. Uh, and there may be some other things that are out there for, um, you know, competing with it or, or more money. Um, but I think for, for starts, it's actually not a bad investment. And then the Sinex camera, you can't burn it out pointing it at bright lights. If you use Gen 2 or Gen 3, you can destroy the image intensifier just accidentally. Or if you take a laser pointer and you swipe it across the phosphor of a Gen 2 or Gen 3, you've destroyed it. You'll have a, a permanent burn mark in, in the, uh, it's actually in the photocathode that gets destroyed. Yeah. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. But not yeah, to but, or to do to somebody else's Gen 2. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and, but the, you know, the resolution being 720p, is, and this is inherent because of the, in order to get the higher low light sensitivity, you have to have larger pixels in order to have the quantum efficiency. And this is why you get the inherently less uh, resolution. And, it's often a trade-off when you go with higher megapixels. But it's not that they couldn't go ahead and actually start creating, you know, uh, if you want to call it panels that are basically mm -hmm. there for capturing that are at a higher resolution, and it's it's just going to be yeah. at a larger size, which which causes increased cost. But if you do that and you blow it out, you're going to get something 
with a much better res, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, they could do that thing like for taking the equivalent of four of those CCD elements and or, um, and ganging them together to make it a high resolution camera with that sensitivity. Yeah, I, if, who not, if they could make it at a price point, that you know they would be people would be beating their doors down to buy that camera. Right, because if you look at what they've got going, you know, I love talking to a hardware guy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because that's it. You, you take four of the panels, put it together. You'd have to have an increase in processing, but it's not like you'd have to have four CPUs to handle what you're dealing with. So yeah, there's right. a, a bill of materials increase for it. And yeah, it probably have to be bigger yeah, just you, because you the overall times, size of it. Four but. times the, the, the data storage, you know, the compression artifacts that go with it. So there's, there's compromises that go with everything. And maybe they've done that. You know, I'm sure the, the engineers thought about it and probably felt that by tooling up to build that, they may not have enough market share to, to justify the Right, because it, it's not like they're going to be able to use that same mold, an injection mold they've got going that they use across yeah. the majority of their cameras, and but all they, they're doing is changing out the guts. The, the key element is the, the silicone, uh, the CCD device that they have that is very photosensitive. Right. And that's why they were able to make that camera do what it does. And it, it does a pretty good job. Have you seen the new one that they have that's uh, geared towards uh, marine? But it's in a uh, pan tilt zoom model. That's you know basically it's kind of like Tom. What's you what you have it. up on your ceiling on your house? Yeah, it's sweet. But but it's in a Psyonix camera. I have not seen it, uh, so I'm not up to date on to what their latest and greatest is. But I, I do like the fact that they're offering a product that for sky watchers uh, to to utilize. Yeah, with a marine mount, which is great. Having yeah, a marine, a marine mount is huge, and I I know we we're gonna lose Dave Altman here soon because he's got a split. But, um, Dave, are you uh, are you hip to talking about what you're working on next, or I mean, are you just gonna be rocking out with Corey F. And and hitting concert tours or what's your plan, bud? So um, right now, right now I'm developing um, four new shows. And then I go on tour with Corey in uh, August. Killer, amazing! But I'll be working. I'll, I'll be working from the road. So jealous! Want your life. Well. <laughs> <laughs> you know. awesome. You'll be with him on my birthday. I just want to throw that out there, just in mm -hmm. case you know. And by the way. My birthday is mm -hmm. Friday. My PayPal <laughs> is no. He wants birthday cake. You're going to be uh, 38 again, right? Or 36. 12 again, yes. Uh, 20, 12. I'll be 12. Yes. That's great. Absolutely. Great show. Great conversation. Uh, my God. How, how would I'm you believe surprised. that over two hours has been uh, passed already? Holy cow. Tom, is there anything that you haven't got to ask? Um, yes and no, but, uh, we're, <laughs> we're running a little late. Tim asked some stuff. Um, sure. We, I think we, can... we got a lot out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know appreciate... some of the stuff they're doing. They, they we can, we can always yeah, do, we can do a we part two. Yeah, sorry about two. that. I'm just, I'm just into the show so much. It's been a great conversation on that note. Let's go ahead. And I want to thank, uh, if you want to call it our guest for coming out, uh, we have, uh, David H Altman. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate you being here. And of course, Mr. Yeah, Dave you. Mason, both from the movie UA, uh, uh, A Terror in the Sky. Uh, yes, Thank while so they've much, got guys. the hat on of UAPX, you're no longer part of UAPX. Oh, before I forget, also, Thomas, let me just say you can find our movie at a tear in the sky oh, Awesome. 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 Thanks. If appreciate for doing that. On that note, I'm gonna, if you guys need to take off, that's understood. I'm just going to go ahead and thank everybody for the super chats and everything here today. It's been a great show, great support. Uh, it's always a, a pleasure having every, uh, you know, people like yourselves who are, tr who are truly making a difference and going and transforming what we're seeing coming out of uh, ufology for that matter. And, you know, this is what, let's me break that word. I said that wrong you know, breaking the model of what we saw ufology is, this is something it's, it's the start of a, we need that term for, for the science approach to it. Uh, uh, Dave. Yeah. I think that's the term. I mean, what else can you call it? Yeah. True. It's something we'll figure out and let's go ahead and get, just get this going really here quick. Um, tells the music. Let me kick this up. Yeah, the audio should be uh, audience should be able to hear this. I think anyway. I want to go ahead and thank the people for the super chats tonight. If I can find where is I've my got 
desktop audio going, and I'm not getting audio coming out of this anyway. I want to thank everybody. What's backwards? There it is. Some desktop audio going for everyone out there. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Yes, Tim's got his little Cyanix uh, <laughs> cup holder and everything. Appreciate it. Yeah, I want I've, to... got, wait, I've got the camera, so hang up. Yeah, me too. Let's I'm doing cameras uh, as I go ahead and yeah. get the list up of the people. I've received. got it. You, oh, you've got it. You got it, Gary? You oh, have the list? Yeah. 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 Nice. My job. Yeah, oh, I've got. Uh, tell us about our super, super chat. chats tonight. The super chats were from W. Decker and Christian Morales. And thank you, Dave Altman and Dave Mason, for being here tonight. Absolutely. Hey, also, want to thank uh, Mr. Thank Tom King for being around and. Uh, uh mr tim senor wonderful day for to have you here happy monday for you thanks for coming out today glad you can see that wonderful smile on your face and on that note let's go ahead and kick this out and i want to go ahead and thank everybody for coming out here tonight happy tuesday everybody look forward to seeing tomorrow and wednesday hump day uh can't wait to see what news is going to be breaking and what we're going to be talking about because we missed catching up on where we're at today i think uh mm -hmm. Well, let's go ahead and then take a look at the chat and see who is still out there. And thank you guys for sticking around for the show. There we go. Uh, Kim Jellen, thanks for coming out. Bob Gray, Michael Elwell, X1. Uh, David Brown, Richard Lanier, uh, Cliff C, Kim Jellen again, Nathan Forrest. Uh, who else we have out there? Ak, 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 our producer in the back. Can't forget about you, Richard Lanier. Uh, Susan Goes, Time Traveling Asians. Uh, let's go to the list now and let's look at our participants. It's uh, Metal M Gaming, uh, Cliff C, of course. Thank you for coming out. We had Linda Thompson, Jan, and uh, Julie Farrell here earlier. I want to thank everybody for coming out here tonight. Happy Tuesday. And as I usually say at the end of every show, eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone. Go back to Party City where you belong. Absolutely. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Take care, everybody. We'll see you. Bye bye.